Welcome to the show. On today's episode, we have Dr. Wendy Tubro. She's a functional medicine gynecologist who struggled with her own mold and metal toxicity, celiac disease, and a variety of other health issues. She published her new book, Dirty Girl, Ditch the Toxins, Look Great, and Feel Freaking Amazing. It's an easy to understand guide to help readers eliminate the invasive toxins responsible for chronic health conditions, so common nowadays. In this episode, we talk about detoxification, health impacts, histamine intolerance, and why we have so many more environmental toxins than previous generations. This is a great episode. Please enjoy. Hi, Dr. Wendy. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, Kat. Nice to be here. Today, we're going to be talking about detoxification, so I'm excited about that. But before we begin, tell us a little bit about your journey and why you became a functional medicine gynecologist. Sure. So the functional medicine gynecologist part is easier because I fell in love with obstetrics and gynecology in med school and was clear, like, that's what I want to do. I want to care for women. And then when I discovered functional medicine, it just became very natural to incorporate that into my practice already. So I wasn't going to change specialties. I was just going to use the functional medicine approach and apply it for women. So I don't do OB obstetrics any longer. I don't deliver babies and I don't do any surgery. I do only office-based women's care. And so that's from the platform of functional medicine. And then my story, well, I guess my story is because my story is how I got into functional medicine because I experienced it as a patient. So my husband was into functional medicine years before I was. And right at, right around when we had, I was pregnant with our second child, he was like, you're just not feeling well. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not. And he said, why don't you see my mentor who was a functional medicine provider in the Boston area? And so I did. I saw him right after, right when I was postpartum, he did a huge workup on me and he diagnosed me with celiac, which my relatives have, but I hadn't been tested. So that's sort of a, if you have relatives with celiac in their first degree, you should be tested, but I didn't know that. And so he diagnosed me with celiac and also with candida imbalances and nutrient mineral deficiencies and food sensitivities. And so I spent like 13, 14 years really working on my gut and my absorption and my body. And then I was doing really well. And then I got two lead exposures over the course of eight months, one of which I knew about but didn't recognize the significance of. And the second I didn't even recognize until months later when uh, it came out. So we were in France right after Notre Dame burned. And right after we came back, I gained almost 10 pounds and lost half the hair on my head and had a rash on my face that was like itchy and burny and painful at the same time. And I was like, what's going on, right? Like no woman wants that. And it took a few months, but reports started coming out about how Notre Dame, when it burned, released 500 tons of lead into the air. And we were right there. And the closer you were, the more you got, the farther away, the less you got. But we were there for a week. And that's right when I went off the cliff. And so that started phase two of recovery, which was, hey, wow, I've really sort of filled up my cup and I'm now overflowing with toxins. And that was the point at which it was really this wake up and health crisis because I felt awful. I didn't feel like I looked my best. My brain didn't work. And so then we dove into toxins and I've spent the last three years peeling those off. Yikes. I'd never even knew <laughs> that could happen. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right? Ignorance is bliss. That's how I feel. <laughs> what are some ways that people can be exposed to lead? Burning buildings? What else? Right. So it's, it's not usually that dramatic. But lead is often, so kids in Michigan, Flint, Michigan, are getting exposed through the lead pipe. So old pipes, and I just heard this report that there's like 10 million lead pipes still in the United States un, unreplaced, which shocks me because it's 2022. So lead pipes is one. Living in a home that was built before 1978 is one because the paint contained lead and it was outlawed in 1978. So there was a little bit of a, a, a ebb and flow time when they were phasing it out. But basically, before 1978, the homes had lead paint in them. And then if you do construction on those homes, you know, all these do DIY weekend warriors who are like, oh, I took the walls down. I'm like, oh, you got a lead exposure. So those are major exposures for people. Yeah. Now I'm thinking of friends who've done DIY projects and gotten uh -huh. sick after, and I'm like, oh, no. 
Yeah. Thing. Yeah. It's well, there's also mold too. Cause so mold and, and metals are like the two big categories of things you can, you can really nail yourself with if you do a DIY project. Hmm. So what are some other examples of toxins that people can be exposed to annoyingly, maybe every day or every couple of days? Yeah, Kat, this is a great question. And I just have to say, I really agree with ignorance is bliss. And I also agree with knowledge is power because you're going to fall somewhere in that spectrum. And so the question is only do what you're, the statement is only do what you're ready for, right? So I think of it like, what are you putting on in your body? That's you can get exposed to toxins in your food, single-use plastic water bottles, alcohol, sugar. These are all things that negatively impact the body and make it even more difficult to get rid of toxins. And then the toxins on the food themselves. And then for women, what are we putting on our body? So beauty products, hair products, shampoo, conditioner, dyes, all of our makeup, uh, lotions, anything that we're applying to our body. And then what's around us? So the things that you're cleaning your house with, your bed, beds are sprayed with fire, flame retardants because, you know, 150 years ago, we lived in tenements and one person smoked would take down the whole block. So beds are now flame retardant sprayed, except they're endocrine disruptors. So they're not, they're not good for you. Uh, if you pump your own gas, if you have a gasoline car, you're getting exposed to the fumes from that. Plastics, microwaving food in plastic releases chemicals. There's just, it's sort of never, never ending. So, but it's easy to think about what's going in you, what's on you and what's around you. Yeah. I'm, I'm very big on the, don't use the plastics. Don't microwave anything with plastics. Um, when I need a new mattress, I will try to air it out for like a month before I sleep on it, which everybody mm -hmm. thinks is insane. I put like plants all around it because they suck up formaldehyde and chemicals and stuff for new furniture. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I always, I always say to someone, if it needs to be off gassed, don't buy it because even after a month, it's still there, especially from, because your, you know, your face is smushed into it and your body's on it. Uh, there are mattresses actually available that don't use the flame retardants, which is, I would say aim for those. That's like birch or avocado. Those are the best in class. Um, and it, nothing's toxin free, but lesser, like the lesser evils. Yeah, I know it's very difficult for people because mm -hmm. they just want to like maybe get a deal and these products are usually way more expensive. You know, it is. And I always say to people, if you're someone who's sensitive to these things, you're either going to pay now or you're going to pay later. And you just have to think about it that way because these a lot of these toxins are implicated in chronic disease. So Alzheimer's, other dementias, Parkinson's, cancers, autoimmune disease. And so if you think about what's your lost productivity and what are you going to spend on medical treatments and, and medicines and interventions when you get something like that, it actually makes a lot more sense now to pay that little bit more extra money and in every way sort of decrease your exposure. Mm. It's sort of a balance. Yes. So I know that fragrance is a big one. Mm -hmm. So like those plugins, like my mom is old school, so she still has plugins all over her house and she uses uh, the fabric softener with the smells, the detergent with the smells. And I went to visit her and I'm literally itching from head to toe. And she's like, well, what's wrong with you guys? We're all itching because we're all into the natural stuff and we can't deal with the toxins anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's really about total body burden right? So if you were only exposed to maybe the scent, you could deal with it. But then it's the scent piled on with, by the way, it was stressful to get to your mom. So you had to travel and then you're staying in a new place. So add on that layer of stress and then the laundry detergent, and maybe it's slightly different food and your digestion's a little different, pile all those things on and your body can no longer compensate for all these exposures. Yes. So what are some signs that you have trouble eliminating toxins? Yeah. So for, I only treat women, so I'm going to just focus on for women. So if you have, if you have the best diet and you exercise and you sleep and you can't lose weight and you can't sculpt your body the way you think you should be given what you're doing, that's a huge red flag for toxins. If you have any autoimmune disease, so anything... I would say to you, yes, I think that's a toxin issue. 
if you've addressed your food sensitivities and you still have gut irritability or sensitivity or constipation, bloating, any of the upright, anything, I would say, okay, that's an indicator we want to look at toxins. So essentially when you've, when you're doing everything right and you still have some kind of symptom, skin stuff is often, so eczema, psoriasis, rash, acne, all of that's often an indicator that you have toxins. It's very broad, Kat. Like, you, you know, we don't really even think about how common and overwhelming it can be in our environment, but it's all around us. So, and, and this, I call it like the slow drip of torture, right? It just keeps exposing us. And so anything you have a symptom with, I would say is a potential toxin. So why is it that an entire family can be living in the same home with the same products, same foods, and only maybe one is suffering? Great questions. And I get this a lot from people like, why me? I'm next to my husband. He's fine. My my cousin, my brother, whatever it is. So if you think about it, all of us are different genetically and we all have a very different, I'll call it soup. So how you were born, if you were born vaginally, if you had a, if you were born via C-section, and then were you nursed or bottle fed? Did you have any infections when you were a child? Did you have food sensitivities? Did you get antibiotics? Layer the, right? It's more layering on of what the cumulative effect of you and your story. And so all of these things layered on eventually take their toll. And so the person living in the house with mold and everyone else around them is fine. There's definitely a genetic component and there's a component of, have you surpassed what your body can cope with? Because that's when you start to have symptoms. So maybe that's the person who has the more stressful job or doesn't sleep as well or doesn't eat as well. And their body's basically protesting and saying, hey, I really, I really can't do it anymore. You've, you've reached my limit. And how can toxin exposures impact hormones, especially female hormones? Oh, yeah, it's huge, actually. So, so if you think about when you drink from a plastic water bottle, and, and sometimes it's sort of subtle, right? If you, everybody loves kombucha, and it, unless you're making it at home, it's coming in a plastic water bottle, right? It's, it's coming in the plastic bottle, not water, sorry. So if you're drinking kombucha and you're like, cool, I'm helping my microbiome. Yes. And you're getting the xenoestrogens that are confusing the body and throw off the body. So plastics exposures across the board can throw off the endocrine system, which then is hormones. However, anything that stresses the adrenals, the thyroid, or any other part of your body, if it creates a state of stress, your adrenals then start to say to your ovaries, guys, right now we're about to be eaten by a lion. So ovulation and normal hormone balance and digestion, they're really not a priority. So could you tone it down, please? Because we need to put energy into our leg muscles so we can run away. That's really how primitive we are. Even though people say to me all the time, well, I'm not stressed. I'm like, you don't think you're stressed, but your body thinks you're stressed. It's the difference in interpretation because we're super primitive. You know, we still think that we still sort of react like it's 10,000 years ago and the lion's about to eat us. So when you go back to what are the toxins, any plastics layered on top of stress can be an endocrine disruptor for people, for women. Mm. And where do you go to find out if you have detoxification issues? Are there any specific tests that you ask for? Do you need to find a doctor who does functional medicine? How does that yes. work? Totally. Like if you stroll into your PCP and they're not a functional medicine doctor and you're like, test me for toxins, they'll be like, I can do a metals, I can do a test for mercury and lead in the blood, and it'll always be negative unless you've had a recent acute exposure. So definitely functional medicine. And like our practice, we specialize in doing evaluations of toxins, partly because I was so sick and I so saw the impact on it that that's what we now bring to our patients. So you definitely want a functional medicine provider. And then the tests are pretty simple. So we use, we typically don't use blood because it is looking at an acute exposure or what your body can't handle. So we're looking more at urine because you're going to, you're going to bind these and put them in your urine as you take them out. So we do lead and mercury and thallium and cadmium and arsenic. That testing's all via urine. And then we give you a provoking agent to pull even more out so that we can see what are you storing? Because it hangs out in your bones, in your, in your organs, and so in your brain. So 
we're trying to pull out what's there to see, like get a more, more accurate level. And then for mycotoxins, which are the toxins that mold strains put out when they're in you, it's kind of creepy actually when you think about it. So these mycotoxins hang out in you if you're genetically susceptible and they can make you have rashes, asthma, hair loss, weight gain, bloating. It's just a whole list of things. So that's also tested by urine. And then the inv other environmental toxins, such as gasoline fumes, nail polish, uh, plastics, all of those derivatives, as well as pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, glyphosate, all that we test also via urine. And that the nice thing is the mycotoxins, other environment and pesticides are all one test. So you just pee. You literally just pee and that's it. Well, I mean, you have to, you do glutathione for a week, take a hot bath, then you pee. That's the test. It's super easy. But yeah, you do need a functional medicine provider. And what are your thoughts on histamine intolerance? Could that also be a sign of de detoxification issues? Yes, 100%. 100% because basically the system's overloaded and it can't deal with what's being brought to it. So people who have problems either with, uh, you know, histamine is really a funny one because it can be triggered by food. It can be triggered by stress. It can be triggered by like mold in the environment. So it has a lot of overlap with, with mold and mycotoxins. And so, yeah, hundred percent, that would be something that I would say, oh, your system's overloaded. Let's try to understand what's going on. Because mm, I read something about histamine issues and that you can take to check to see if like, um, because I get hormonal migraines mm -hmm. a certain time of the month, only if I eat certain histamine foods, just like right at that time. Any other time, I'm fine. But that time, my histamines, I guess, are a little bit higher and mm -hmm. I can't handle it. And I and they said, <clears throat> take a Benadryl and if it helps your migraine or your symptoms, then it's histamine and it worked. And that's scary. <laughs> yep. And then avoiding the high histamine foods can also be really impactful. But sometimes it's hard, especially if you're doing other dietary avoidance or restriction. It can be like, oh my goodness, it, it can be sort of restrictive and challenging for people, but avoiding the foods around that time can help. Mm. Yeah. So women who are still cycling, I've noticed that, like I said, at different points of their cycle, that they can handle just toxins in general better than mm -hmm. others. So what are the times where you can and that you can't, so you know, like how to plan? <laughs> It's harder to say that as a broad brushstroke because some people are really thrown off by ovulation. And so then, so what, here's what I'll say. If where the difficult part of your cycle is, is the part where you want to dial it back. So it, so let's start at the beginning. If your period is super heavy, crampy, clotty, uncomfortable, then I would say, okay, we really need to look at your gut health and that's the time to be super strict and, and dial it back and make sure you get enough rest. But if you're thrown off by ovulation, which some women are, then that's the time you're going to want to be. Or if you have PMS, that's the time. So rather than just saying, because everyone's different. So whatever your hardest time is, that's the time you're going to want to quiet things down, be super compliant. I mean, a lot of this stuff is fixable too. I don't want women to think, oh, I just have to deal with it. No, it's fixable. But in the interim, while we're fixing it, that's when you want to be really dial into how to how to be as compliant as possible on your program. And um, let's talk about diet because I've heard like mm -hmm. um, they, some doctors say, "Oh, you need to do a strict vegan diet." Some doctors say you need to do a strict uh, paleo diet or do keto for like you know these type of issues, detoxification and histamines, all those things. And I'm always confused by that because <laughs> everybody has this very dogmatic approach. I don't know. Yeah. It, uh, well, it's so funny. Like I, people who are vegan are like passionate vegan, right? And then the people who are keto are passionate keto. So everyone has their thing. So I, that none of those necessarily are the holy grail. And I, I really believe that your body is going to tell us what is right for it. And having said that, there's a baseline that I think we could agree on, meaning don't eat processed food. It's not healthy for you. Even gluten-free. Like for me, I can't eat gluten because of the celiac, but I don't eat the replacements because they're just as bad for you, if not worse sometimes. So don't eat processed food. Here's the unpopular part. Don't eat sugar and don't drink alcohol. 
those are the unpopular ones, but, but they really stress both the adrenals and the liver and make it harder for them to detoxify you and keep you in balance. So don't do those. And then the goal would be eat food that looks like itself, right? That's the big bucket of how I would recommend people eat. And then within that, some people, so if you're someone who is more cardiometabolic and balanced, then I would say, okay, you're going to want to head towards keto, either strict keto or keto light. If you're someone who has autoimmune disease and you're going to want to head towards autoimmune paleo. If you're someone who uh, just feels better when they don't eat processed food, you're going to want to stick in sort of the middle around, around paleo. But it's, it's fluid. It's not, it's not a cast in stone, you must and you mustn't. It's a, here's the way that I'd recommend you craft it and then account for, oh, I'm going to a wedding, so I'm going to, have, I'm going to plan for an excursion or I have a birthday party, whatever those special occasions are that you may want to go off the program that works for you. I never like thinking of it as a diet because that's not permanent, right? Like we're looking at what's going to be sustainable for you to do over time, as opposed to a crash course, a crash diet, something temporary. Those don't really help you. And I would recommend not doing them actually, because those, you know, those, those almost do worse because all the yo-yoing confuses your body. And what are your thoughts on like Epsom salt, hot baths, sauna, things like that? Love it. Love it, love it, love it. So anything that gets you sweating, and it's hard to think of, well, oh, I'm sweating in the bath, but you are. And then that Epsom salt, you're utilizing magnesium a thousand times a second for all of these bioenergetic transformations that are occurring, and none of us have enough magnesium. So Epsom salt baths are fantastic. And I, I have a lot of clients who live like in the city. And I'm like, you don't have to immerse your whole body. You could do a foot bath. It's okay. So you can get a little bucket, put hot water in, put some Epsom salt in. And it's of course not the same as immersing your whole body, but you can certainly get a sweat on from continuing to replace the hot water. I sit sometimes if I don't want a bath, I'll sit on my bathroom counter, stick my feet in the sink and just soak and keep adding hot water, keep adding Epsom salt. My husband's like, are you ever coming to bed? I'm like, yeah, but I'm busy, I'm like soaking here. So saunas are fantastic, especially infrared saunas that can get deep near mid far that can get into all the different layers of cells. Those are fantastic Epsom salt baths, even just to soak if you don't have Epsom salt and then exercise. So sweaty exercise that gets you sweating is very impactful for moving toxins because you excrete through your skin. So it's really important after exercise and after sauna, especially that you shower. So that's pretty important, but I think they're fantastic. Sauna blankets too. I mean, at pretty much anything that you're like, is that good? I'm like, yes, everything is better than nothing. Yeah. Cause I, I heard that after you sweat, you have to immediately rinse it off and to use like castor soap or some like, I don't know what it's called, but Castile soap, Castile. you know, like the more natural soap to just rinse everything off. It's the best way. And I don't know, I do those things, but people think I'm crazy. <laughs> no, I don't agree at all. I, I don't agree that you're crazy. I think it's, it's really, um, I think the problem is that we so quickly went from not too many toxins to way too many toxins. And we just haven't even had a chance to synthesize that information in our brains. But when you think about the incidence of cancer, dementia, autoimmune disease, the percentages are skyrocketing compared with, 50 years ago, I'm 51. When I was born, autoimmune was not a thing. You know, people didn't have autoimmune disease. Now, 50 years later, they do. So I would argue that those interventions you're doing go a really long way to counteracting the impact of everything we're exposed to because it's everywhere. Yeah, it is. And I, even the food, I'm like, I try to avoid conventional fruits and vegetables, get more mm -hmm. organic, get pasture raised eggs instead of like, you know, the cage free fake ones or whatever, the nice. other options that are not really that great. But um, you tell this to an older person, the older generation, like my mom's generation and like older than that. And they're just like, you're insane. Eggs are eggs. You know, vegetables are vegetables. You don't need to worry about that. You kids today with your fake allergies. <laughs> I don't think you can open a closed mind. You know, I think that's really difficult. But I do think it's reasonable to point to the statistics that all of these things are increasing and increasing at much earlier ages. And so 
you know, you can say they, they've actually looked at, it's fascinating, they stored blood from military recruits like a hundred years ago. They've been storing blood in a deep freeze and tested it for celiac disease and found that it was like, um, I forget the statistics. The the but I'm never good at remembering the exact statistics, but the incidence now of celiac is four times greater than it was in these stored blood samples. I think it was like a quarter of a percent, and because now it's one percent of the population, so four times increase in a hundred year span is a huge difference. And so the argument goes back to data. But you can't open a closed mind. But you can say, well, you have to look at the data. When you look at the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, cancer, dementia, heart disease, in diabetes, every single one of them is hugely increased over what they were even 100 years ago. And so that has to point to something in our lives and environment that would, that would do that because we're all, we're not any different genetically except for our epigenetics, which is the epigenetics is the part of our genetics that will turn on or off a gene, making it more or less likely to, to show up. So I have epigenetic genes for celiac that are nasty. Like everyone in my family has celiac. My kids are all sensitive to gluten and they only got gluten for a couple of years before we were like, oh wait, you're sensitive to gluten. You're coming off. So it, it's much more virulent now than it used to be. But I would answer those comments with facts. Like, because... You can't really argue with quarter of a percent to 1%. That's a huge change. Mm. And what are your thoughts on gluten in other countries where they maybe they don't store it in silos? Because one of the big things is how they store it in this country and mm -hmm. how all the mold involved in the storage process. Yeah. And even before we get to that, American, but it dates back to... I want to say the 30s and 40s, there were there were food shortages. And so wheat in particular was hybridized. It's not genetically modified per se, but it was changed and bred in order to grow faster, be drought resistant, be resistant to different pests, and also not to fall over the tolerant got, and also to be small. So instead of, you know, you think about wheat fields and it's like this five foot tall waving wheat. No, it's like two feet tall and it was bred to do these things. But when it was bred like that, it increased the incidence, um, the concentration of gluten in the actual wheat. And so it's more allergenic than it used to be. Now you layer on that it's treated with pesticides, which disrupt our microbiome. Glyphosate is the most commonly used herbicide in the world and it disrupts the microbiome. And so then you layer on it sitting in the silos getting moldy. By the time you get to that point, you've got a number of issues already. So and that's in America. I'm not actually sure how they process it in other countries, but I know it's not hybridized. So the concentration of gluten is much less. So people who are gluten sensitive can often actually go to Europe and eat a baguette in France. I didn't try this when we were in France because I have celiac. And so for me, I'm like, I don't want to challenge the immune system. But if you have true just gluten sensitivity, sometimes you can tolerate that. Mm. And I found the same thing when it comes to, like, for example, a lot of my friends are sensitive to maybe soy mm -hmm. or gluten or corn or something like that. And when I have, when I had my chickens, they were able to eat those eggs for my chickens because uh, they ate, you know, bugs and <clears throat> things yeah. like that. Like they didn't have uh, grains and things that they wouldn't have in nature. I didn't feed them that. So they didn't have any allergies. And they're like, I thought I was like allergic to eggs my whole life. No. Isn't that funny, Kat? I, we have our own chickens and we feed them a gluten-free feed and we feed them all the food leftover, you know, the table scraps and all that stuff. I'm able to eat my own eggs and I'm very sick still, not very sick, but I, I notice when I eat commercial eggs, I get sick from them because they're fed on this diet of wheat and soy. And what's really interesting, they've found, uh, especially with soy, they've found soy in the actual eggs, not just on the outside of them, but in the eggs. So it is somehow transmitting through. And so the contamination of things really does impact how people do. You're totally right. Yeah, I remember when I was in Italy, we did a tour of 
this farm and they was they were raising like these type of wild boars they have over there they have like a little stripe around their stomach that's white and the rest of them are dark and they're really cute and they showed us look see how happy they are we make sure our animals are happy because happy animals taste better and they were saying mm -hmm. how like the uh the omega uh, of their fat was healthy whereas if we go and eat like a boar or pig in the u.s it's like unhealthy inflammatory mm -hmm. so th there's a lot of layers to that so temple grandin did this amazing research i think also like 50 60 years ago about the different inflammatory markers that cows would secrete as they were headed for slaughter because they got stressed and that that impacted the quality of the meat and her research actually has been in implemented all throughout the country in slaughterhouses so that cows aren't stressed as they go for for slaughter. So that's one layer. And then the next layer is that grass-fed, grass-finished animals do have a different impact in our body. So it's it seems to be less acidic for us and that it doesn't throw off the acid-base balance in quite the same way. And it really does impact how how we respond to the the flesh. So it's it's very interesting. I I don't know if it personally if it goes down into the omegas. I just haven't looked at that research, but it would make sense because they're eating you know they're eating the omega through the greens through the grass. So what are your thoughts on like where can people get the best quality food when you go to the shopping mall? Yeah. I mean the grocery store. What are you looking for? What are you avoiding? <clears throat> this, this is so complex. So let me just preface this by saying I have four kids and a live-in nanny and at least my mother-in-law or my mother eats with us every night. So seven nights a week for dinner, we feed seven people. So the, the mechanics of this are somewhat different than if it were just me and my husband. So take what I say with a grain of salt because we really feed a lot. And then they like to eat for breakfast and lunch too, which is crazy, but we feed them every, every day. So so I, we buy our beef directly from a farmer. Now, because, and this is why I was stressing, like I have four kids, so we go through a lot more food than one or two people did. So we actually bought a whole cow and have done so for the last few years. So we buy the meat directly from the farmer. And what's nice is he's a small farmer, so he'll work with us on like, one year he gave us so many bottom round roasts. I was like, dude, I don't know how to cook these and my kids don't like them. So can we like ixnay on the bottom round roasts and the top round roasts? He's like, yeah, sure, we'll make it into ground beef. I'm like, oh, I can do that? Who knew? So, so we go right to the farmer. So that's one. And then we have chickens in our backyard. Our neighbors think we're nuts. I mean, we live in Newton, which is this town that's very sort of urban. <laughs> it's not suburban. And our neighbors are like, why do you have chickens? I'm like, so we can eat them. So we have our own eggs. And then the next part gets a, a little more nuanced. So anything we can buy organic, we buy organic, period. Um, my husband actually was started taking over the shopping a, a, about six months ago and he came home with non-organic berries. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? And he goes, it's so much more expensive to buy organic. I said, you're totally right, but we're going to buy organic because same thing about, we want to not fill the kids with pesticides now so that later their chance of chronic illnesses is much less. That's the philosophy we're taking on that. So he's bought organic ever since then. So organic wherever possible, local wherever possible. We do have a CSA, a community supported agriculture program that we belong to. And, you know, on one hand, it's like, what am I going to do with all these sort of random foods? And on the other hand, we've just gotten into, let's try it. Let's see what we can do. The internet's fantastic. Excuse me. And so wherever organic, do that local whenever possible, in season whenever possible eating with the seasons can be meaningful. And then the next layer is do your best. So people like to put things in their coffee, which by the way, can be moldy. So look for a brand that's tested, either Bulletproof or Purity is a brand that's tested for, uh, for mold toxins. Purity I know is organic. I don't know if Bulletproof is organic. So people like to put stuff in their coffee. My vote is if you're gonna do cow's milk dairy, have it be uh, organic. If you can get something from a local farmer, great. In Massachusetts, you're not allowed to sell unpasteurized milk. So that's a little bit more difficult to do. I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the country. But try to get things that are organic and, if possible, local. And, and 
sort through that wherever possible, right? And then I don't want the listeners to think like, oh my God, she's perfect, right? No way. I mean, I don't eat the processed stuff, but my kids do. And so what we're trying to do in any part of that is have it be organic, no pesticides wherever possible. And, you know, they go to school, they live in this world. And so basically the message is do your best and don't sweat the small stuff, right? Because, you know, we go to five different stores almost every week. It's pretty crazy to keep us stocked. <laughs> yeah, I joined like a co-op where we get the stuff shipped in from the Amish. And it's like, it's like, I think it's almost an illegal organization because you have to go <laughs> pick it up. We get like a, a bunch of people and we buy a bunch of stuff and they ship it in a, in a freezer truck mm -hmm. and then we pick it up from somebody's garage. <laughs> I mean, it's people find a way to get the yes. stuff. Yeah. So do I mean, that sounds amazing. Now I'm wondering if they ship up here. I think that'd be really cool. I'm sure they do. <laughs> but anyways, and another thing that I found was um, to save money, because I know a lot of people are like, I know what to do, but how do I do it as cheaply as possible? And I always say um, frozen organic berries in bulk are cheaper than fresh. So I do that. You can get a huge bag. Yep. And yeah, I just buy a lot of organic stuff in bulk, frozen, so I can store it. Yeah, I think that's great. And, um, you know, pickling and canning, if you have your own garden, that's another way to save money. We actually, we have a tiny plot of land. We have our, our yard is 8,000 square feet. That includes the house. So it's, it's an eighth of an acre. And alongside our driveway, we have six raised beds to the left of our driveway. And it produces... I mean, it produces more kale than we can eat. I only let my husband plant one vine of, of squash because, you know, one, one squash just seems to produce ever, ever, never ending. So if you have outdoor space, planting can be a really great way to save some money. And then you can can what you make um, or freeze, depending on how. It's hard to freeze. You have to, I've not mastered freezing it fresh, but you can cook it and then freeze it. Mm. Yes. So... Let's say you want to cut out some toxins. You're listening to us and you're like, I need to do this. What should you cut out? And do you have to cut out everything at once or should you do it little by little? Um, because I heard some people can get sick if they do it too much, too fast. Is that a thing? All right. So there's a lot in that. Let's address the too much, too fast. So the biggest thing that people often react to from a uh, it's called a Herxheimer reaction. When you take too much away or change too much too quickly, you can have that reaction. And it makes you feel like you have the flu. Joint aches, brain fog. You don't really get a fever, but you feel like you have the flu coming on. So that the most common time that happens is if you, there's two parts to that. One is if you completely go cold turkey on sugar and eliminate it, you can have a Herxheimer reaction within the first two weeks of doing that. And then if you have a lot of processed food in your in your eating plan and you take it out, you can also have a Herxheimer from that. So those are, but usually if you stop exposing yourself to other toxins just by don't expose, you're not going to have a reaction. So you're not going to harm yourself by saying, I'm going to get rid of my cleaning products and take them from toxic to non-toxic. You won't, you won't have a Herxheimer from that. You don't have a Herxheimer from the removal of exposure, but in your body, you can have a Herxheimer when you start to remove things. It's a little bit different, right? So think again about in your body, on your body, and around your body. So I always say, no, you're not going to do it all at once. Don't go crazy trying to do it at once. It's going to make you super anxious. It's expensive, especially like the moment you decide you're going to level up is usually the moment when you've gotten a delivery and you're like, whoa, that's terrible, right? No, use it up and then level up. So the food is a little bit easier because ongoingly, you know, you run out of your vegetables, replace them with organic. You can invest in a glass or stainless steel water bottle so that you're no longer drinking from single use. Those single use plastic water bottles are like the devil. If you can get rid of those, you've done a huge thing for your body and for the earth. So that would be a really impactful thing to do. If you have two cases of water, finish it, right? Just finish it and then don't buy it again, okay? Uh, so it was not to be wasteful, but or donate it, but don't let it sit in your car because then it, when you heat the plastic too, that releases even more chemicals. So 
back to what can you do? Say you're running out of mascara or it's like, oh, it's eight weeks. It's time to replace my mascara. Great. Level up at that point. When you run out of blush, level up. But here's the thing. You might have done a good job and not known it. So before you throw out what you have, double check on Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, or Think Journey. Those are two great sites that can say, oh, you did a good job, or hmm, room for improvement. With, on the EWG site, I always aim for like one, two, or three, even one or two, honestly, for, for the rating. <clears throat> and then things around you, you know, don't buy a new bed unless you're in the market for one. But if you're in the market for one, get a get level up and get one that doesn't have flame retardants in it. When you run out of cleaning supplies, get clean ones. So it's it's an ongoing process. I've been in this for three years and I will say, Kat, I sometimes screw something up because I get whitewashed or greenwashed. So I'm all excited about my new product. I have I was running around. I completely forgot to look at EWG. I was just so psyched about the deal and how good it looked. And then I get it and I have a moment of brain space and I go, I never looked that up. So I look it up and then I'm like, oh, I've been had again, right? So be nice to yourself because you're going to screw it up. And that's just the process that we're in. So I've been in this process for three years. We have our laundry, our dishwashing, our house cleaning. It's all cleaned up. I have my makeup all cleaned up. Our food is 99, 95, 99% there. And there's still opportunities that I find. So it's going to be an ongoing process of iteration and really be nice to yourself because it won't, you won't be done in a day. Probably it'd take you one to two years to really clean everything out. Yeah, I know. I've been working on it for over 10 years actually. And <laughs> I got to the point where I make my own soap. I make a lot of my own skincare. I make a lot of makeup at this point Yeah, because I just, there's not much. Mm-hmm that I really like. Now it's getting better. It's getting so much better. But before it was absolutely impossible to find anything. Yeah, it really was. Beauty Counter is one of my new favorite brands. I feel like I've been living under a rock, right? I didn't know about them. And now I discovered them. I'm like, cool, everybody should use it because it's clean. Are there any maybe superfoods that are great to add to your diet to strengthen detoxification <clears throat> pathways or maybe supplements that you recommend? Sure. So what you want to do when you're eating is help phase two in your liver uh, because phase, so let's, uh, now I have to tell you what, what am I talking about? So phase one, your liver's responsible for doing a lot of your body's detox, not all of it, but a lot. And in that process, there's two phases. Phase one takes something that's often inert and makes it a toxic intermediate, which makes no sense, but that's just what the body does. And then phase two takes that toxic intermediate and, in, and binds it to a methyl group, a sulfur group, uh, a glucuronidase. Glucor there's a number of different ways. There's six different pathways that phase two can go down to take that toxic intermediate, bind it, and then you get rid of it. Now, phase one is usually reasonably fast. Phase two is often slower. So now you have your body taking inert stuff, making it more toxic, and your body's like, I can't deal with that right now. Hang out in the fat till I can get to you, right? This is why people are saying, oh, I can't lose weight. Well, that's because your fat's storing all these toxins. And until you get rid of it, you're not going to be able to lose weight. So back to, to detoxing and what people can do. So you're going to, ideally, if you can find foods that will help phase two in the liver. So there's a whole list and I can get you that afterwards, but flesh increases phase two in the liver. So any flesh, so meat, chicken, other poultry like duck or turkey, pork, fish, eggs, all of these help improve phase two in the liver. And then there's a number of different uh, vegetables and herbs that you can also do to help improve phase two. So there's like a ton of things you can do. And I'll, I will send you that list as soon as we hang up. So you can, if you want to do it, that as some kind of link for the listeners, they can. And so that's pretty natural, right? It's just food. And then the more you can do not to challenge your system, the better. So avoid alcohol. This is, what, this is where avoiding alcohol comes in because your liver has to process it. And so obviously if it's doing X, it's not going to do Y. So if it's processing alcohol, it's not going to process toxins. So don't, don't give the liver opportunity to be challenged and stressed. Take that away. 
make sure you do the platform thing. So if you don't sleep, you're not going to detox. If you're a stress ball, you're not going to detox. If you're in relationships that don't work for you, it impairs detox. So it's really important to work on what I'll call the foundational behaviors. So that's eat well, get enough sleep, manage your stress, manage your relationships, and move your body so that you sweat and build your muscle regularly. That's the platform. You have to do those in order to detox. Okay. And then you can take certain supplements that help the liver. So, and this is the part where if you're trying to specifically remove something, you need to work with a functional medicine provider because you can hurt yourself. But big picture, things that you can't really hurt yourself with that are good for you. So N-acetylcysteine, alpha lipoic acid, glutathione, vitamin C, these are all things that help the liver do what it needs to do. Methylated B vitamins, these are all fantastic for people um, up to certain points, right? Like don't triple the recommended dose. Work with a provider if you're going to go above and beyond. And then don't do fad diets, right? Because if you say go on a crash detox for two weeks and you release a ton of toxins from your fat because you've lost all this weight, but your body can't deal with the toxins, it can make you sick. So I, I usually recommend against fad detox things that are like promising to fix you within a week because it's just not how it works. You know, it takes, it takes a while. It really is a process as opposed to flicking a switch and here you go, you're done. So you mentioned sleep. So I always say like um, stop eating five hours before bed and make sure you sleep at the right time. Just don't, you can't like really make up for it during the day because I, you know, I've read studies on that. So what are your thoughts on what sleep does for detoxification? Right. So when you sleep, the space in your brain, the space between the cells enlarges so that your brain can drain out toxins. It's crazy. It actually works. So so what I say about sleep is most people need more sleep than they're actually getting. So when patients say they're so proud they got to sleep by 1130 and they get up by six, I'm like, ah, that's not enough sleep. So most people should be in bed for around eight hours, which means you would get somewhere between seven and seven and a half hours of actual sleep when you account for the wake times. That's usually a place where people do pretty well. So meaning you can do seven hours, you can, some people need more, but, but certainly the goal would be to stay in bed for, for eight hours. Okay. And, and during that time, make sure you're actually sleeping as much as possible. This is a whole other podcast episode to talk about, like, what do you do with sleep if you always wake up between two and four in the morning and can't fall asleep and can't back back to sleep? There's a lot in that. So that's sort of a whole other conversation, but sleep's really critical to focus on and make sure that you honor your needs. Yeah, I'm very big on sleep. I always tell my husband, like, if I have problems falling asleep for whatever reason, I did something wrong the day before, I will stay in bed and tell him to, like, handle, like, taking the kid to school and all this stuff so I can get more sleep. And I will notice, like, if I wake up without sleeping enough, my eye bags are, like, huge. I feel terrible. I feel bloated and everything. Mm -hmm. But then if I just go back and sleep a little bit more, I wake up, they're gone, stomach's flat, everything's perfect again. And it's just that I needed more sleep. Yeah. It's very stressful on the body not to sleep in, in so many ways. So not only does it shut down detox because it's a stressful state. So when you stress, you're back to the adrenals who are saying, guys, you know, the adrenals are very primitive and think a lion's going to eat you. So the adrenals are going to be screaming out like, we're about to be eaten. Don't digest. Don't detox. Focus on survival, right? So, and it'll shut down digestion so you can get bloated because the bacteria there are psyched. You know, the anaerobic bacteria are like, cool, food sitting around. The yeast are psyched because they are not not impacted by digestion. So there's a lot of things that happen. So yeah, you're totally right, Kat. It's it's really important to sleep. So tell us again about why you need a personal evaluation before you begin a detox journey. What can go wrong? <laughs> sure. So there's a lot you can do in your detox journey before you get to a personal evaluation. So like all the things that you're doing where you're working hard to eat organic and avoid toxins in your daily life by making your own soap and making your own makeup. Like these are things that you can do. You don't need a personal evaluation. That's simply removing what's filling up the pump. That you can always do. 
my husband was like, why aren't you pumping your gas anymore? It costs more money. And I was like, remember back to that same argument that it's in my body. I actually tested it. So it was in my body and I don't want any more of it because it causes problems for me. So you don't need a personal evaluation to systematically remove ways in which you're exposed. But you do, if you want to target the things that are in your body, you need to collect the data because otherwise you have no idea what you're treating and if it's making a difference. So the other side to that is, so it's very hard to hurt yourself with treatment for mycotoxins. They're just binders. It's, you know, things like activated charcoal, chlorella, f different fibers. One, one is a script called uh, Wellcall, which is a medicine, but it's hard to harm yourself with those things. On the other hand, if you're treating for metals, you can harm yourself because the treatment for metals also pulls out the minerals and nutrients. And so if you overshoot, you won't understand why you feel so cruddy, but you've pulled out your zinc in particular, which helps balance out at the level, the cellular level, you really need zinc. And so if you're pulling out too much zinc, it throws off the cellular balance, increases inflammation, makes you feel cruddy, impacts your hair, skin, nails, mood, thyroid. So it has all these con consequences. So avoidance, you don't need me specific treatment, you need someone like me or me, but someone, someone who will really get the data and allow you to pinpoint, you know, cause you might have metals and mycotoxins and environmental toxins. In that case, we're going to prioritize and say, well, what's the most important? What's the worst? Let's get that done. And tell us a little bit about your book, Dirty Girl, Ditch the Toxins, Look Great, Feel Amazing. Sure. Well, when I did all this work on myself, you know, when I was such a mess three years ago, I had lead, mercury, four strains of mycotoxins, eight different environmental toxins. I didn't have glyphosate. It was the only thing I was like, yay, no glyphosate. But I had all this other stuff. And I looked at my husband and I said, I am the poster child for healthy living and I am such a dirty girl. And then I went, that's the book we need to write because I'm the poster child for healthy living and I have all these problems. What does everyone else have if they're not necessarily as far along on the path as I am? So let's write this book. It serves as a roadmap for people to start walking through their life and cleaning it up and avoiding toxins and, and feeling better. You know, I will say it's really impactful to get rid of all these things because you feel better. You look better and feel better. So we wrote that book and that was the, that was the whole reasoning behind it. And it's really, it's really meant to be a roadmap. So what would be maybe one or two tips that we won't think of like on our own that can help detox our lives, something we can implement right away. So in the realm of relationships, make sure that your relationships are healthy emotionally. You know, you might not think how impactful it is to have an unhealthy relationship, but if you're in a relationship that's toxic, it will set off that whole cascade in the adrenals where your body thinks you're going to be eaten by a lion. When in reality, what's happening is you're stressed because your relationship's not, not healthy. So if you're being belittled or someone's super critical of you or you don't feel safe, those all set off that adrenal pathway. So something that would be surprising is fix your relationship. Either fix it, go to therapy, go to transformational work, go to coaching, or get out. There's really only two paths, fix it or get out. And if you've done everything you can, get out if it's not, not good. And then another sort of, I mean, we've talked about alcohol, which is, I know people listening are like, no, don't take away my wine. And I'm like, well, but, but it's really bad for you. It's essentially drinking toxins. And so try to avoid alcohol and sugar because sugar sets off that whole cascade too. So this would be like three really impactful things people can do like right now. And then the fourth would be as you're running out of your, your lipstick, your makeup, your hair product, whatever it is look to see if there's a cleaner option so that you can stop exposing. And how can everyone work with you? Do you still have a private practice? Do you see patients virtually? Uh, yes and yes. So we have a clinic in Newton, Massachusetts, and we do do telemedicine. It's called Five Journeys. And uh, we, we have either the insurance plan or the cash plan. It depends what people, what works for them. And we also have nutrition on staff so that because food is so critical. So we have people start with food and work with us simultaneously. So yes, we love working with people. And where can everybody find you online and which social media platforms are you the most active on? 
Sure. So uh, our website is fivejourneys.com. That's spelled out F-I-V-E and then journeys. And then I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. I'm probably most active on Instagram. And the handle for all of those is Wendy Trubo MD. And Wendy has a different spelling because I changed my name when I was 13. So W-E-N-D-I-E, T-R-U-B-O-W-M-D. And then the company profile is number five, Journeys Health, across Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. And our, our Instagram and Facebook, we're all sort of intertwined because I'm the company and the company's me, but we have a, I have my own profile and the company. And then we also have a, a guide, uh, which I don't want to forget to mention, which is a com- meant to be a companion to the book. You know, now that you've read the book and you're freaking out about all the sources of toxins you need to address, there's the now what. And the now what is our non-toxic guide to healthy living, which really is what bed should you buy and what pans and pots should you buy and what makeup is good. That's all in the guide. And that's at fivejourneys.com forward slash promo. And so that's a free guide for people to just put your email in and we'll send that out to you. That's such a great guide. So I'm going to check that out too. So is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we have to go? The last thing I would say is it can feel overwhelming and and like you're never going to get there. And what I always say is Rome wasn't built in a day and you won't be either. Be nice to yourself. Take it slowly. You're going to get there. You can do this. Awesome. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure, Kat. Thanks for having me on.